Hello, this is Paul M. Salmon, author of Future Noir, The Making of Blade Runner. And now I'd like to share some of my memories of writer Philip K. Dick. I first met Phil at Cal State Fullerton College in Orange County, California in 1973, following a lecture Phil had delivered there. Then, over the ensuing decade, our paths randomly crisscrossed a few more times, but mostly in an informal sense, certainly not in a professional one. However, between early 1980 and 1982, over an intense, all-too-brief two-year period, I was both fortunate enough and honored to meet with, interview, and visit the home of Philip K. Dick. This occurred approximately two dozen times over as many months. And during this period of time, Phil and I talked and talked and talked about many, many things. Not only Blade Runner and not only Electric Sheep. Philosophy, religion, science, motion pictures, music, opera, many, many, many different things. Both Phil and I loved to talk and we both <laughs> ran with the opportunity whenever we had the chance. What you are about to hear are a number of brief audio excerpts from different interviews I transcribed and or taped with Philip K. Dick during that 1980-1982 period. The talks that you are going to hear basically break down into two parts. In early 1980, you will hear Phil talk about his reactions to the first Hampton Fancher screenplay to the way he felt he was being mistreated by the Blade Runner production company and by his vociferous rejection of same. Then in 1982, virtually three weeks before Philip's untimely death from a stroke, you will hear him speaking about his changed attitude towards the project, how excited he was about the additions that writer David Webb Peoples had made to Hampton Fancher's screenplay, and at the end, you will hear Philip K. Dick's reactions to both director Ridley Scott and to Blade Runner star Harrison Ford. I hope you enjoy all of it. Just as I have enjoyed my bittersweet stroll down memory lane, revisiting a man I cared for very much, and an artist whose work I still very much admire. And now, from the long lost past, the voice of Philip K. Dick. Uh, okay. Alrighty. And uh, could you give me some kind of history on the background of uh, Electric Sheep? You know, what uh, prompted you to start writing it, or, you know, uh, what you were trying to say in it, or anything like that? Yeah, sure. Um, it it uh, stems from a interest on my part in the problem of differentiating the authentic human being from the reflex machine, which I call an android, uh -huh. uh, trying to find criteria which would be applicable to actual human life as we know it now. That is, qualities that show, for example, in the schizoid affective type which is a flattening of affect, an inappropriate uh, emotion accompanying, you know, ratiocination. Right. Uh, where, for me, th the word android is a metaphor for people who are physiologically human but psychologically behaving in a non-human way. I got interested in this when I was doing research for Man in the High Castle, and I was studying the Nazi mentality, and I discovered that although these people were highly intelligent, they were definitely deficient in some manner in appropriate affect, in appropriate emotions that, that, that would accompany, you know, the, the intellectual process. Mm -hmm. And as I studied the Nazi mentality, the, the, especially uh, the uh, castle system and the SS that were being deliberately created as cadres, I became conscious of the possibility of a very highly intelligent human being who was emotionally uh, so defective that the word human could not properly be applied to him. And I use this in my writing in terms of uh, such terms as android and robot, but I'm really referring to an actually psychologically defective or malfunctioning or pathological human being. Mm -hmm. I know. Okay. Uh, how would you say that sheep fits into the body of your work? Well, it, by the time I got to sheep, I was revolutionary enough and existential enough in my, in my attitude to believe that these defective personalities were so lethal, so dangerous to human beings that it might be necessary ultimately to fight them.
that, that uh, in other words, the only, that they could not be cured, they could not be changed, and that we might literally have to, it might literally wind up as a contest to see whether the humans won or the, quote, androids, unquote, won. Now, the problem then would be that would we become like the androids in our very effort to wipe them out, you see? Ah, yes. Would, would, would we inhale the contagion in the very act of trying to uh, abolish the, the contagious uh, element? Uh -huh. You see, so a further problem is then created, is, 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 the, is the paradox of if you kill a person because he's inhuman, do you not become inhuman in the act of killing him? Yes, I see. That's interesting, because you put in Descartes, then, you put uh, that uh, conflict. Okay. Would you have liked to have done the screenplay on it yourself, or? Certainly. Ah, I see. Had you ever done uh, any screenplays before? Yeah, I did a screenplay for Ubik, and, I, and I've done, I did scripts for the Mutual Broadcasting System, um, radio scripts, and uh, I'd love to do a screenplay. Ah, I see. What was the uh, Mutual Broadcasting System? When were you doing those? Uh, it was in the 50s, and it was a science fiction half-hour program on the MBS network, uh, and uh, I... I, I did three, and I, they, I did it until the program folded. I would have gone on and done more. I, I really enjoy that kind of writing. Uh -huh. What was the name of the program? I have to admit, I don't remember the name now. Yeah. Well, how do you feel about, you know, Hollywood anyway, and this whole, you know, process of getting wrapped up in, uh, you know, the transition of a book into a film? Uh, um, well, let's put it this way. Mm -hmm. If I answer the phone and it's a call from Hollywood or a call from my agent in New York concerning Hollywood, I cringe. Mm -hmm. I have a flinch reaction. Um, it, I have never known any good news to come out of Hollywood. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, it's bad news if they bought it, it's bad news if they're going to make it, it's bad news if they didn't buy it, and it's bad news if they're not, you know, I mean, if, uh, I, I just... You know, I, I, I can't even say that I've gotten into the position where Hollywood has damaged me because my flinch reaction is so powerful in me that uh, I haven't even got close enough to uh, be damaged. I will not go up there. I just simply won't get in the car and drive up to Hollywood. I, you would have to kill me <laughs> and prop me up in the seat with, with a smile painted on my face to get me to go near Hollywood. Uh -huh. If I received a letter from Hollywood and I could see a check in it, I might have a friend of mine open it up and take the check <laughs> out and hand me the check. Uh -huh. But I would not read the letter, and if I was forced to read the letter, I would, I would try to assimilate as little material from the letter as I possibly could. Were you ever considered to do the Blade Runner script at all? Or? No, well, no. Shit, they never contacted me. Never, not at all, huh? No. Mm. No, in fact, you know, uh, they never even contacted me because, you know, the, for the possibility of script consult, you see. Mm. Which, which, would, which would have been, a, you know, at least something you, one would think they might want me to be. It would be script consult. Mm. Well, what, if, what is your thoughts then on a transition of a novel into a film? You know, I mean, is it uh, kind of an unsettling process or what? Well, you, it's like... In, in Japan where they make building blocks out of garbage. <laughs> I mean, it, 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 it's, it's amazing that it can be done at all, you see. Uh -huh. It's like, you know, a pig that can whistle the Star Spangled Banner, but it's, you know, in the wrong key. You're amazed that the pig can do it at all. I mean, if they can take my novel and make a movie out of it, I'm amazed that, that they can make a movie at all. Uh -huh. I don't understand, you know, how any movie has ever been made in the first place, because it is such a committee effort, you know, and I don't understand, you know, it's, it's a, every, my, as my agent put it, it's a miracle that, that any movie has ever been made. Uh, I don't understand how it's done. I don't know enough about movies to know how it's done. Uh, my feeling is that these are two different media, and uh, rarely, my, 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 my observations are based on where I've read the novel and seen the film, that it's very rare that the uh, conversion from film, from, from novel to film is successful. But uh, I have seen cases where it's been successful, and those cases justify the effort. So I'm not against it in principle. I see. That said, I hadn't realized that you had been so left out of the picture, you know, as far as the, uh, the movie was concerned, because uh, they had, they, uh, come to think of it, the time when I spent up there at the, at the studios, I, I was there uh, a week ago today. And uh, I talked to Dealey for a couple of hours, and I talked to Scott for a couple of hours, and then I looked at all the artwork that they've got, and I talked to some of the other people. And your name didn't come up very often now that I come to think of it. 
you know. And uh, they, they never, there wasn't anything derogatory said, or, you know, or on the other hand, there wasn't anything laudatory said either. It was just... Uh, well, how, how would they know? <laughs> I mean, they got no basis. Yeah. You know, neither of us, see, at this point, neither side, if you want to call it side, neither party, uh -huh. has any basis for appraising. Well, they've got some basis for appraising me because they've got my book. Uh -huh. They know more about me than, than I know about them. They've read my novel. I haven't read their, their screenplay, you say. Uh -huh. So they, they certainly know something. But I, l let us put, let, let me say this. That I'm, I really am surprised that Hampton Fancher has not contacted me because we, we were friends, and uh, I liked him. And uh, I would, just from a personal standpoint, have liked to, liked to have seen his work and liked to have seen him again. Well, you know, I'm going to be talking to Hampton tomorrow. Um, I could mention that if you'd like, and, and not say that you said it, you know, or something like that. That uh, you know, that I just understand you're kind of curious as to why, you know, he hasn't gotten in touch or something. Well, d don't don't make me sound like I'm kvetching, because okay. like I don't want to sound like one of these people that says I'm surprised that when they came to London, they did not stop off at Buckingham Palace and make the obligatory, you know, uh, <laughs> bow and curtsy before the Queen. Right. The thing is that I, I just, you know, I, I wonder, you know, Hampton got a hold of me in 70, you know, four, uh -huh. and, uh, you know, we, we, we were, you know, I, I just, you know, but, but I, what, I, what I put this down to is just, as I say, thinking of it anthropologically, they are one tribe and I, I'm a member of another tribe. Uh -huh. And apparently, you know, we, we, we live in separate worlds. Uh -huh. Even though geographically, you know, I am very close to them. You see, for instance, I, I was having a, a, a drink with Ray Bradbury a, 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 a few months ago, a couple months ago, and I mentioned that we ha had heard about the movie by the trades, by reading the trades, and he was scandalized. He started yelling at me and tearing on and just haranguing me uh, that I was a babe in the woods, that I in no way should I have found out about this movie from the trades. Uh, you see what I mean? He said, yeah, sure, he yeah. said this, this is just unacceptable that a writer should find out because somebody called him up and said, I see an article in the trades, uh, is it true? And then the writer says, I don't know, <laughs> read, 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 read the article. <laughs> yeah. And they read the article, and then the writer says, well, gee, I don't know if it's true, and I'll call my agent. Then the writer calls his agent, and he says, hey, uh, Russ, is this true? And the agent says, I don't know. I didn't know Ridley Scott and Michael Dealey were involved in this picture at all, see? I know. Well, uh, what did you think of that, that first draft? I know you weren't uh, real happy with it the first time. It was draft. just one terrible screenplay, oh. and uh, that was my opinion. Now, I can't pretend that I'm an expert on screenplays. I don't see that many screenplays. It's not like with a novel where I read, you know, many, many, many novels. But it was intrinsically disappointing. It was terribly corny, and uh, it was it was uh, extremely uh, maladroit throughout. I mean, it, 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 okay, in terms of what it was trying to do, uh -huh. it didn't do that well. I mean, my, my opinion was doubly uh, negative in that I did not approve of what it tried to do, and I did not think it accomplished what it tried to do. It had dropped out so many things from the book, and it had concentrated simply on what we discussed before was that lurid collision of, you know, androids and, and humans where, you know, it's uh, only one of us is going to emerge alive, it's you or me, you know, and there's a lot of lasers get fired. And, of course, the human emerges and the android doesn't. So I, I, right, in the Starlight thing, you said they aimed low and failed in what they aimed at. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right, yeah. I thought that was pretty clever of me, but I'm, I'm not sure that made Hampton all that happy. <laughs> he said, oh my God, here goes my career. What in the book, or were there still, you know, things in the book that now aren't in the film? I mean, in the uh, first draft of the screenplay that Well, no, I saw two, I saw two drafts by Hampton. Uh -huh. uh, and uh, one draft where people did come in. And, um, Neither draft by Hampton was any good, and uh, I, I knew that it was being rewritten all the time, and uh, I believe you talked to Hampton, had you not, for the Omni article. Right, yeah. And uh, he spoke of rewriting it, rewriting it, and I'm sure there were many, many rewrites, but uh, it really wasn't so much what they had left out that bothered me, because I do know that things have to be left out when you transfer a novel to a screenplay. I mean, there's just no, there's just no way around it. I mean, this is not the fault of the, of the screenwriter, the scriptwriter. He's got to do this. Uh, the thing is, though, that what they had made, what they had retained, was was the central thing, which is the detective Rick Decker in the future uh -huh. tracking down these uh, what they're now called, of course, is replicants. Right. But whatever they're called, they're fake human beings, and they're and they're somewhat dangerous. Uh, that that the execution of the script is bad because what he had done was he had relied on the the old, overworked, really cliche-ridden figure of 
Philip Marlowe and Sam Spade, you know, unify, and they were already doing movie parodies of that figure in the, you know, in the, in the, in the London trench coat, you know, and, uh, you uh, know, um, and then the voiceover, you know, it was a dirty town, it was a dirty job, someone had to do the job, and that was the way the script went, it literally had voiceover, and, and it had that same kind of voiceover, and then it had that awful thing where, the, you know, the gun is turned over to Rachel, the android, and then she mercifully for everyone's sake does herself in, you know. And, uh, does he walk away tight-lipped, a bit wiser or something like that? Or? Uh, yes, he has grown in stature uh -huh. uh, from the experience, uh, uh -huh. but he's, he, what it is, he's really, uh, grown in stature is just a sobriquet for he had become even more cynical than ever. <laughs> All that means to become older and more cynical, which is apparently is how these people mature. <laughs> and uh, th there's a confusion between world weariness sophistication and 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 what i would call spiritual wisdom spiritual wisdom i mean so really it was you know kind of a bumbling effort from start to finish and i said so and i, I did that originally in my little article for select tv right and uh that got back to the studio and i know because i'm the one who turned it over to him uh you did did you send it uh, into them or yes i did <laughs> i would have loved to have given them input throughout i mean free input gratis input i would have loved to have uh, acted as some kind of feedback loop with whoever was you know doing the screenplay uh -huh. and you know come up with any suggestions that i could have you know and and, so, and i just assumed Hamlet would call me because we had been you know pretty close for a while there, around 1974 and 75 and um i have to admit you know that, that it irritated me that, that the studio in hampton never asked for uh, you know any feedback from me i mean because I, I would have contributed happily uh -huh. do you remember when that select tv uh, thing was that you oh well, i have it right here paul i i i, I you have a date on it here. yeah okay. let me let me fish around down here all right okay it's uh february 15th uh and what year let me check the year um 81 well i presume yeah would yeah. be 81 would it yeah okay okay we can see all right, I'll stick that in there. You said that uh, that alien, uh, when referring to it, that a monster is a monster in a spaceship is a spaceship, and it just got by on special effects. I said that. Yeah, yeah they must have loved that. Yeah. Well, oh, hey, you know, when I met Ridley, I kept thinking, you know, uh, of of that statement that I made, and and thinking that Ridley had certainly seen that statement, and that uh, as he looked at me and I looked at him, he must have been thinking that statement. You know, a spaceship is a spaceship, monster is a monster, and and I thought, you know, it may be that Ridley just popped me one right here, you know, but he was very cordial. He was awfully nice to both me and to my friend Mary, who went with me, uh -huh. and he just treated us very, very nice. I mean, it was just very, very fine treatment that we received. Yeah, I, uh, we had a very frank discussion. Uh, we disagreed openly uh -huh. about certain things. In other words, it wasn't just, you know, uh, formal cliches, you know, form of cliches of formality, you know, in terms of uh, mutual compliments. I mean, I express certain ideas that I hoped would be in the film, and Ridley said they would not be in the film. And yet, we, we, he was very, he was very friendly, and he was very open and very uh, upfront. I mean, he, he was very uh, honest with with what he said, and we, we did disagree on a number of points. I mean, we disagreed openly, and yet the air of cordiality was maintained. We spent quite a, we, spent, we, were, we were together quite a while. We, we, we were together during the showing of the 20 minutes of the film. Uh, the pieces that you know were ready to be shown, and really sat behind Mary and me, and he would lean over at each section and explain, you know, the continuity to us and everything, you know, because they were, you know, they weren't connected; they were, they were, you know, separate sections. Uh -huh. And uh, then afterwards, we went in, we we sat together, and we talked for a long time, you know, and, and uh, it was just great. And uh, I I expressed what I wanted to see, and he said, well. Too bad. <laughs> <laughs> so nothing that you suggested is going to end up in the movie. No, 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 no. I wouldn't say that. No, no. I, I would just say that there were certain things that I had hoped would show up in the movie, which which are not going to show up in the movie. Uh -huh. Is there anything that you specifically suggested that might end up in the movie that you can think of? Well, let's put it this way. Here I go again. I'm going to get calls from everybody on this. They're, they're all going to be on the phone. In fact, I'll I'll see the phone melt now. Yeah, I don't know. Um, the main difference between what Ridley views this all in terms of and what I view it all in terms of is as follows. To me, the replicants, or androids if you will, are deplorable because they are cool, they are cold, they are selfish, they are heartless, they are completely self-centered, they have no empathy, they don't care about what happens to other creatures, and to me this is essentially a, a, a less than human uh, entity for that reason. Uh -huh. Now Ridley said that he regarded them as Superman who couldn't fly. He said they, they, they are smarter than humans, they are stronger than humans, and they have faster reflexes than humans. Uh -huh. Well, then I said, well, gee, really? I mean, 
holy smoke, uh, golly, levels. And that was about all I could think of to say, you know. Uh, that's rather a great divergence, you see. We've gone from somebody who is a simulation of the authentic human to someone who is literally superior to the authentic human. So we, we've now flipped all the cards on the table, you see, when we do that. In other words, all the cards were up or not down, all the ones are down or not up. And um, I, I was at a loss at that point, you know, to, to respond. I mean, I, I said, well, um, okay, I said, now the theme of the book is that Rick Deckard is dehumanized in his job of tracking down the replicants and killing them. That, in other words, he winds up essentially like they are. And Ridley said that he regarded that as an intellectual idea, and he was not interested in making an esoteric film. <laughs> you don't remember, because once I read the David W. Peebles version, I, I literally, I, I bulk erased everything from the two <laughs> previous screenplays. I, did, I literally did not want to remember them, because what I wanted to do when I discussed the film and the screenplay was to discuss what I knew would be the basis of the shooting script. See, at that point, we had a problem. I had made a judgment on the basis of Hampton's screenplay, which I believe I talked with you about. I know I've talked with several interviewers about that. Uh -huh. uh, and it then became very, very vital for me to do a, an about face after I read the later version that, where David W. Peebles had come in, because his, his is so much better that virtually everything that I had been saying was, was no longer applicable. In fact, it was diametrically uh, nulled, uh -huh. null, nullified and voided. And, 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 uh, I had to be very careful to go back to interviewers and inform them that I had read a later screenplay and that my feelings were quite different than they had been, you see. Yeah, it's done. Now, Peebles is uh, evidently upset that I uh, that I uh, uh, praised him so highly because it puts Peebles in an awkward position. I mean, he does not want to be singled out at the expense of Hampton. But this is not my problem. I, I mean, I have no objection to singling him out. People says that Ridley was responsible for a lot of the changes in that final version that they used, you see. Yeah. But the yeah. thing is that somebody did it, either Ridley did it or David W. Peoples did it, somebody did it, yeah, and it's Peoples whose name is on the script, uh -huh. you see. So I'm going to assume until proved otherwise, since it's David Peoples' name on the script, that he's the one who did it. Well, okay, then uh, I guess I can't ask you this question yet, because I, I, I want to ask you what you feel about the movie now, but you haven't seen it yet, so I guess I'll have to wait on that one. But, no, uh, I, I can tell you about what I saw. Uh, okay, well, what do you feel about what you've seen? It was the greatest 20 minutes I ever experienced. Oh, yeah, it's, it's good, huh? It's, it's, we, we came out in shock. Mary and I came out in a state of shock. In fact, when I closed my eyes, I could still see that opening sequence. Oh, well. <laughs> oh, God, on the, on, the, on the big screen, it's just incredible. I mean, they've got detail. You'd have to see the film five times for your brain to pick up all the, all the little clues. I mean, there's just so much. You know what's like? I'll tell you, after Mary and I got back down here, I spent about a month thinking over what I'd seen, and I realized that Blade Runner will be one of the biggest information dumps, in, you know, dumping information at you, you know, firing information at you that exists in the modern world. There literally is so much information created and fired at you by that film that it is just like a tremendous experience in terms of taking in information. I mean, it's very thrilling to the to the to the viewer or the audience, whatever you want to call it, uh, to to sit there and have all this information fired at you. I mean, there's signs, there's people walking along, there's vehicles, there's store windows, there's there's uh, Oh, it's just, it's just everything. I mean, it's, just, it's, uh, it's a tremendously information-rich experience. Well, that sounds a lot like uh, Ridley, the way he works, too, as he just tries to uh, squeeze as much detail as he can get into the screen. Uh, I mean, there, there's, this, there's this blimp that flies over real low, you know, it's so low it's between the buildings, uh, and it's got a big screen on it, you know, and words and everything, and people talking, and it just, it's like a movie within a movie. I mean, you can sit there and just watch the blimp and get your $5 worth. Uh, <laughs> I mean, it's, 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 it's incredible. I mean, it, it is the richest experience that I have ever seen in terms of, of, of pure information. I mean, it, it's like being transported to the ultimate, you know, city of, of the future. I mean, it, with all the good things about it and all the bad things about it, I mean, the, the, the glamorous part of the big city of today is even more glamorous. It's exponentially, you know, glamorized up to the max. And then the, 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 the shoddy, the seamy, the ugly, you know, the repellent parts are just ghastly. I mean, in other words, it, it's going to the extremes in both directions. Uh -huh. Ah, well, it's, uh, that's certainly something I'm looking to forward to seeing to. I've been writing about it now for about a year. <laughs> well, I want to yeah, see more. I mean, I'm just, I'm enthralled by it. It, it is a hypnotizing experience to, to sit there and see some of that footage. Okay, so well, I think that'll do it. That sounds like a good cutoff point right there.
That's this characterization you're talking about. If, I, if you can use another cliche, you're talking about soul, I think. Oh, oh yeah, right. And, but the thing is, this, this did not worry me because uh, I, I'm pretty sure from what I saw on the screen and from the screenplay that Harrison Ford is quite aware of the ambiguities facing the character Rick Decker in his tracking down the android. I mean, it's really built into the to the plot. I mean, it's it's really there. There is just is no way of getting around it. I mean, uh, what he has to do is essentially distasteful to it. And I, I, I although I didn't, I haven't seen the finished film, of course. Uh, they will have a rough cut pretty soon. Uh -huh. But uh, I, I'm sure that Harrison will will be able to carry it carry it off. I, I, I have enough confidence in Harrison Ford as an actor to to pose in advance that he will show the, the, the ravages done to uh, the character Rick Deckard in the pursuit of his job. I'm sure that Harrison will, will show that. Okay. 